I had a tenant downstairs and two of my college roommates lived with me upstairs and I actually was making $100 a month right from, uh, right from day one with that. So you turned home equity into cash flow day one. Exactly. <laughs> yes. All started well, back then. That's the TikTok <laughs> dream. Yeah. Right. Hello and welcome everyone to this episode of the Framework Podcast. We're in our special week here of talking about home equity and retirement planning. Um, we're joined by uh, my other host, Anna. Anna, great to see you. Great to see you too, Jamie. So we're out here live at FPA National recording this episode. I'm joined by Dr. Craig Lemoyne again. Uh, you know, Craig, as I, I know we're, you're going to be here all week, so we're super excited so to have you on. so happy that you have me. Thank you. Right. And uh, joined by another uh, uh, individual who I get to call my friend and I've gotten to work with now for probably close to 10 years now right. at this point maybe not quite 10 but a while we're getting there uh, yeah we're getting there <laughs> but steve uh thank you for joining the show and uh for those of you uh steve this is actually your first time on the show i'm like everybody yes, else is. on here so yep. <laughs> even though i've known you for 10 years it's the first time you're having me on but that's, that's all right it's pretty good <laughs> he doesn't sound bitter at all <laughs> no <laughs> not at all actually, look. the phrase is save the best for last exactly yeah, there, no, you, go. there you go yeah look if you had waited three more days you would never be on the exactly. show with me so <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> sad uh, laughs. Sad tonight. laughs. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Steve, uh, tell everybody just 30 seconds of uh, who you are, what you do. Uh, I wear two hats, actually. Uh, one, I am a financial advisor. I have been for 30 plus years. Uh, and then secondly, I am vice president of retirement strategies for Finance of America Reverse. And we are a reverse mortgage lender, one of the largest in the country. So in that role, I help educate financial advisors about using home equity in their financial planning process. That's yeah. awesome. And Steve, uh, since it's your first time on the show, we want to ask you some of our fun favorite okay, questions. Great. So tell us your first money memory. Wow. Uh, my first money memory. Well, I was, uh, I can't say how old I was. I was probably about this high, but uh, my grandfather used to take me probably three or four times a year down to his brokerage firm. And in those days, they actually had ticker tapes coming out of the machines. I'm very old. And uh, we would go down there and meet with his broker and watch the ticker tapes for a few hours. And then he would take me over to the men's club where we would have lunch with all of his cronies and smoking cigars and <laughs> drinking brandy and talking about finance. So that was my earliest uh, uh, mem money memories. Cool. Yeah, really it was great. Cool. It really was. And then we were talking about your first big significant purchase earlier before we hopped on. Tell us about that. Uh, well, I've always been interested in home equity. I bought my first house when I was 21. As soon as I turned 21, I signed the papers the next day because I couldn't get a mortgage till then. Uh, and I had a, it was a duplex. I had a tenant downstairs and two of my college roommates lived with me upstairs. And I actually was making $100 a month right from, uh, right from day one with that. You turned home equity into cash flow day one. Exactly. <laughs> yes. All started well, back then. That's the TikTok <laughs> dream. Yeah. Right. What was the interest rate when you, do you remember it? 5%. Okay. And it was an FHA fully assumable mortgage, which already added a premium to the value of your home because you could sell it to anyone who, if they normally couldn't qualify for a mortgage, they could still take this over. Yeah. They don't make those loans anymore. Yeah, do they do they have any assumable mortgages anymore? Or I very few. I don't know if they're assumable, but I know that changed to or the fully assumable changed to where you had to qualify in order to okay. assume it. I don't think they have those anymore. I either. know my first house ever I bought had an assumable mortgage, and when it came time to sell, that was like gold. Exactly. Yeah. It was right to yes. Up. Yeah. Yeah, that's a super. It's a. I, I I ran into some. I didn't watch it, but I saw a TikTok on like somebody was talking about it the other week and I didn't end up well I just kept scrolling yes. I was looking for Marvel content yeah, I wanted I to see Thanos yeah, doing something great. right yeah, I just it. yeah right. you know more important stuff yeah yeah, yeah. Sure. that's why I'm on TikTok to watch old Marvel clips of movies that I haven't seen in a long time of course. and that's what I like doing there uh, so one of the things we want to do in this episode, Steve, is get a little bit of the view of where is the reverse mortgage space today. We've had some researchers on, Barry Sachs, Wade Fowl, Shelly Giordano right. talked a little bit about the history of the academy um, with Craig. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think from your perspective, you bridge this advisor and real world of um, what's happening in the space. So I think getting that right. perspective from you is super important. So maybe just start with, uh, give us a little bit of a, a, a lay down on What's happening in the space right now? What are you seeing? Um, you know, most of our most of our listeners are in the advisory world. So, sure. what should they know about sure. the space today? Uh, well, I think 
No, what I'm what I am seeing still is a tremendous amount of interest in using home equity as part of a financial plan, uh, and it, and it's great to fill in gaps when you have a plan, plan that, you know, may have some shortfalls. For example, they may not have enough long-term care protection or backup funding for poor market conditions, things like that. So there's still a tremendous amount of interest in that. Um, I think the interest rates have kind of put a damper on the utilization of the mm -hmm. program, in particular with the proprietary products. We have interest rates that are probably in the 10% range. And that's, even though there's never payment required with a reverse mortgage, it's hard to see your uh, interest accruing against the property at those higher levels. So where it's coming into play more, I think, um, in regards to the higher interest rates are people establishing credit lines with the FHA product because mm -hmm. you're not worried really about accumulating debt right. but you are accumulating available credit Huge at benefit. a higher rate yes yes yeah the, I, I think that's one of the can you explain that part a little bit because that one kind of goes against probably how most people view like high interest in like a lending product right because mm -hmm. there's actually a big benefit there. So would you kind of walk people through it a little bit? Right. Well, the, the FHA product has a line of credit option and that line of credit growth, it has a growth rate that's tied to what the current interest mm -hmm. rates are. So if you have uh, rates that are now, say, in the 8% range, your available line of credit is growing at that same 8% range. Yeah. This is really helpful if you're looking to use that home uh, or that equity for, say, for example, long-term care planning. You may need it 20 years down the road. Well, you kind of have a built-in inflation factor with that line of credit because being tied to interest rates, as interest rates go up, that's because inflation is going up. So you have a greater pool of money available to you 20 years yeah. down the road than you may not have otherwise had. And that, I think, surprises a lot of people because most credit lines tend to grow related to the property then. Exactly. Not related to the interest that would otherwise be charged against exactly. the line. Right. And that's a that's a great point and a huge benefit as well too. I know uh, you know in 2009 at, when the markets were collapsing, I had a lot of my clients who had HELOCs against their property, mm -hmm. and they were calling and saying, you know, we've got to pay this off. The bank has frozen it. They want this paid off because the value of the collateral had collapsed. And with the FHA reverse line of credit, it's not tied to the collateral once that loan is in place. So. Your property value could decline, the stock market could decline. It doesn't matter that available line of credit will continue to grow and compound at whatever the current note rate is on and, that And line. I think that plays back to earlier in this week, specifically when we talked to uh, Dr. Fowl, we dug into the idea of <clears throat> having sort of a buffer strategy mm -hmm. retirement mm -hmm. approach. And when you see, okay, interest rates are high right now, that can be very stressful on borrowing, it can be stressful on moving, it can be stressful <coughs> on getting a new Ford mortgage. But here's the flip, right, yeah. to that is now this buffer that I could spend if markets crash is growing at a much more aggressive rate than it has in the right. past. So, you know, that's one takeaway where reverse mortgages add that certain unique product feature that we can use as a hedge later on. Exactly. What do you see today, Steve, as the main usage point of the product? Like, how are people spending the money? What are they using it for? Is it to fix up homes? Is it to, like, where are people kind of leveraging the product today from a use standpoint? And I know that occurs a little bit after the reverse side gets involved, but obviously from the advisor standpoint, that would be key right. to it, right? You know, I think the, to be honest with you, I think the vast majority of utilizations is to pay off an existing mortgage okay. and it's all a cash flow play let's get rid of that existing payment that's impacting the cash flow sure. to the household that's that's by far the the number one utilization I would love to see it evolve to other utilizations like using it to manage long-term care expenses backup funding for yeah. lines or for um, poor sequence of returns things like that but that still is not the priority. Right now, when we talk with advisors, it's usually always, how do we get rid of a mortgage payment? And when you look at that, um, I thought this was an interesting thing. I did it a couple years ago. I don't know where rates are falling right now, uh, but uh, the reverse product, well, you do have to qualify for it. It's not um, credit rated adjusted for right. your rates, correct? Right, correct. And so an interesting thing is somebody with kind of like, I wouldn't say terrible credit, but like medium credit could actually sometimes get a lower rate with a reverse than they would with a traditional. Um, mm. And I, I always thought that was interesting because if you're, you know, 
in your mid 60s and you're just looking at a mortgage, right. you actually might just want to look at both. Yep. To right. My, actually, like rate shop. To sure. Some sure. Yeah. Do that you see that happen much, or is it mostly just existing mortgages that people are trying to, you know, turn off that outflow of cash monthly payment? That's what I'm seeing. It's, it's yeah. mainly eliminating that existing payment. Um, what's not working in the space right now? So you said, told us what's working. You said, hey, I wish it was more broad, but what's not working? Um, kind of, you know, what's not resonating? What's not getting picked up? What products aren't working? I know most of the world's the Heckam product, which is the FHA right, one, right. but there were other products being developed. What's kind of happened to the market? Yeah, I, I think uh, the proprietary products are the ones that are having a harder time in this marketplace. And again, it's because the interest rates are so high on those. We have some great strategies that you could utilize for higher net worth clients, um, which can make sense. But when they look at that price or the uh, you know the interest rate that's tied to it, they're kind of walking away from it. So, I think there's a real damper on the the uh, proprietary products. So we're seeing it more. You know, the the opportunity to work with higher net worth clients has diminished dramatically, and we're back down to mass affluent to slightly fluent borrowers as a potential market. It, I guess so. When you say mass affluent, what were the size of those kind of loans in the proprietary versus kind of the Heckam? Where is that break point? Well, in the in the proprietary products, I mean, we could do a um, um, two million dollar loan on a five or six million dollar property. Those we were seeing as as great opportunities, um, you know, for the product. The higher net worth clients were seeing those as great opportunities to leverage that asset. Um, we're just not seeing that now. Yeah. And uh, where is the loan amount today up to for the Heckam product or the, I guess the, I mean, I know the loans then based off of it, but what's the, the right. cap number that they base the, the value of the house? $1,089,300 okay. is the FHA lending limit. Yeah. So that loan amount, of course, as you said, is based off and of that. And that's basically almost doubled then over the last yeah. decade. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So that has also kind of moved into the proprietary yeah. space as well. <laughs> yes. Because yeah. I remember it was like, you know, five, high five, 600,000 mm -hmm. for right. a while, and right. then all of a yeah. sudden it just ballooned up, and that yes. probably covers the ma vast majority of houses at that point, It does, right? it does, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Steve, I'm interested in your perspective as an advisor too, because this week we've also talked a lot about resources and education for advisors mm -hmm. and things like that. So. As an advisor who also works in this space, right. let's talk about your journey into that and how other advisors or how you recommend they kind of learn about it and resources for them. How? How they learn about the reverse mortgage space and home okay. equity and financial planning. Well, I think uh, at Finance of America, for example, mm -hmm. uh, in my division, what we do is work with advisors directly. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of webinars for them. Uh, we have an opportunity to really just run scenarios. When I start, actually, when I started that division at Finance of America, and this is why I'm kind of endeared to them because I had a vision as an advisor. I wanted some place where I could go and get information about the program without being hounded by a salesperson. Mm -hmm. And they bought into the concept. The the company is very pro education, very pro getting the word out there because we know that, you know, in the bigger picture down the road, the more people that understand it, the more benefits will be out, you know, for for uh, more Americans. So they were very into that concept. So one of the things that we do is we can run scenarios for for advisors. Like we have advisors call me all the time and say. I don't know if this would work, but this is the case. Tell me, could we do something? And I can quickly run numbers for them and say, yeah. And then we can have a discussion about it, advisor to advisor per se. I understand what their needs are, what their concerns are, and we can have that discussion. If it makes sense for that client, we do have the ability to take it to the next step and fulfill the loan. And I have a non-commissioned sales staff, an origination staff, not sales staff, origination staff who can fulfill those loans. But we never go to that level until after we've had conversations with the advisor and we agree that it makes sense for the client. Yep. I mean, I think that one of the things that I've seen from my perspective is consolidation, right? A lot of consolidation in this industry. Mm -hmm. and. I think that consolidation speaks to some extent to Steve's earlier comment on proprietary. That proprietary market, I think the risk in that market to the lender is pretty high. Yes. And it's higher, you know, 
rapid interest rate increases create more risk in that space. So exactly. I think, you know, right now we're seeing maybe a, a foot off the gas in that area. But to your end on higher FHA, you know, uh, heck of numbers, I think it's right. going to be a little more competition in that space. What, uh, I guess, Steve, any takeaway from some of the consolidation in the industry? Do you think it opens up some opportunity right now or, you know, any view on that? And just in uh, some of the, you know, I think some players have left this, you know, especially if we take a little bit longer of a view, going back 10, right. 15 years, right. we had a lot of people oh, leave, yeah. yes. then some consolidation. Some new people come in, but not a ton, right? Right. Um, right. So any kind of view on just the general broad-based space? Um, you know, I... In general, no. What I, personally, what I would like to see is an expansion of the space. I think we've done enough consolidation. I would like to see the expansion. I would love to see banks get back into this program where they were into it years ago. I think it helps to add some credibility to the program, uh, maybe more insurance companies, but that's kind of where I would like to see it go. Yeah, it. It. I think that would be true. I mean, when it was kind of at its biggest point, right, you had some of the larger banking financial exactly. inst institutions in the space. Uh, so what's working with advisors today? So let's go to that level. Like, where in their conversations is this coming up? What information is resonating with them as you're out talking and educating? I mean, you're doing a session, I think, here again at FPA. Right. You were here last year right. at FPA National. Um, you do a lot of events with advisors. What's working in the messaging and education with them right now? As far as that, uh, what is working, it's, well, first of all, as I mentioned before, the cash flow management, eliminating a mortgage payment, um, you know, a lot of advisors just don't really understand that there's never a principal interest payment required for as long as the client is living in the home. So if we can eliminate an existing mortgage payment, you could be adding, what, $1,000, $2,000 per month to cash flow. That may help, may save distribution rates from being excessive, etc. So that works, that resonates well. The second thing is long-term care management. We all know premiums for any sort of long-term care planning is very expensive, and that can be a huge drain on a retirement uh, income stream as well. So if we can eliminate that and still manage the risk with that reverse line of credit, that's helpful also. Uh, the third thing where I get a tremendous amount of interest is using the uh, reverse mortgage line of credit to pay taxes on Roth conversions. We're all concerned about taxes coming down the road, where they're going to go, uh, deficits, etc. And here we have an opportunity to convert monies into a Roth, which is probably the greatest retirement planning tool for sure. middle America, and yet we don't have the cash flow to pay the taxes. This is an opportunity to leverage the home and move that asset into a much better long-term position. Yeah. You've done a little bit of work on that one, uh, you know, the Roth. Uh, kind of cash flow conversation. Right. What's some of the, I guess when you have that conversation, you present on, you talk to advisors, what's uh, what's the uptick on that? Are advisors using it or is it more like interest, like mental interest, but like when the rubber meets the road, we're not kind of seeing the pull yeah. through, right? Because well, it's one of those things like, you're like, hey, look, we can write it down in an Excel sheet. It looks great. Yep, it looks great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then where does it go? Well, you know, I was actually hoping to get a white paper on this done. I've never heard this story. Point. I didn't hear the story at all. It's good. That's, that's a good story. My my thought was that this if half we could the table, get some uh, research. Totally. <laughs> if we could get let's some research. Down. I'm going to drop the ball. Huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this, there, there's a line in the sand of people asked to write the white paper. Okay. Exactly. And, uh, and the, the outcome of that. Uh, yeah, it never really happened. No. So uh, the little background, it's a, it, you know, we're allowed to tell stories on the show. Okay, See, I think Steve started off by asking me to write a white yes, paper, yes. Um, came up with an arrangement around it. Uh, never put it in writing, which I, I believe Kellen gave you uh, <laughs> so, some heartache about. Well, you yes. didn't put it in writing, and you're like, nope, and then I just never did it. Yep. Then Craig came into the picture. He was going to do it. I was going to do it. And then, <laughs> no, no, Craig so I over. got far enough to look at the Excel and tweak a little modeling. That's as far as I got. Pretty good. But to actually turn that into a Word doc, like Word that's doc, where the yeah. gap happened okay. on my end. Yeah. So, Sounds but, like there's some opportunity out there, yes. though, right, for well, somebody see, to write you a And that's web. why I think, you know, th that every time I speak about it, whenever I'm doing a presentation, the advisors are like, wow, never thought of it, never thought of that. And it's because they haven't heard about it, and that's why I was hoping some sort of uh, yeah. publication may help to broaden that. But they're very interested. Um, I've done 
done it several times with uh, my own clients. Mm -hmm. I know of some other advisors who have, but I think it's still at the phase where, wow, that's kind of an interesting concept. Let me run some numbers. Oh, yeah. So I think there's a lot yeah. of potential there. Did, and how did you, when you did it for your clients, yeah. how did you, did you model that via traditional playing software? Did you have to use some reverse software? And, because that's one interesting thing, right? It's a software world here. Like they've been kind of separate, right? Well, exactly. The reverse I mean, and the yes. planning, and they don't super well coordinate. There's a little bit of money guide, right? Yes. Or, but yes, it's all pretty but it's, limited. It's right? not with the line of credit. There's yeah. no software program that I'm aware of right now that has that line of credit uh, to pull into the planning uh, right. analysis. I end up using some reverse mortgage uh, programs. I end up doing my own Excel spreadsheets and kind of combining them together. It's an, it's an arduous process, and I would love to see some sort of program that is able to encompass it all and do it for me, but uh, we're not there yet. Well, it's definitely one where you hand model and hand crank it. Exactly. That's where we're at. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know you've had those conversations with tech providers over the last couple right. of years. What's been the like hurdle to kind of going from, you know, I think you, you, you get the conversations, but it doesn't seem to yet turn into product from the tech providers. Right, and, I, and you know, I think it's just all economics as far as that goes. Yeah. You know, the, the, the providers have to look at what is the potential marketplace for this versus how much is it going to cost us to implement this yep. in our program, and they have to make an evaluation. And the, you know, the reverse market is still very, very small, so. Yeah. It's um, it's not a very profitable opportunity at this point, I think. Yeah. So we're um, still kind of doing it manually. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit of some of the other initiatives that that you and Far and your organization have done in the last couple of years? I know you have a partnership with Morningstar, right? FPA. Exactly. Yep. Um, I think a couple other ones. Yeah. Uh, well, we're we're um, tied in with the Stanford Center on Longevity, and we kind of support them. Uh, but those are the three main ones. Okay. Morningstar is a new one. That was just this past year that we joined mm -hmm. on with them. Uh, and that's been a great um, opportunity for us to help educate a broader base of advisors as well. How does that one work? Well, we're actually on their workstation platform. And we do uh, they do market some webinars mm -hmm. that we do to, to, their, um, to their membership. OK. And uh, how have, you've partnered with FPA for a couple years now. So we're out here. Uh, yeah, right. How's that relationship been, and why did you pick FPA, I guess, is always a great question, right? Why did you want to partner with the Financial Planning Association, uh, you know, versus, you know, there's a lot of other associations out sure. there in the world, but you, yes. you picked something um, on well, purpose. Well, actually, all right, so we're just talking here. Actually, FPA kind of came to us, yeah. and uh, I was doing a presentation, it was probably five years ago, I think, and what happened was I started out my presentation by saying, I am not a reverse mortgage salesperson, I am a financial advisor. And everyone's head looked up, including the FPA people who were in the room, and they approached me afterwards and said, we've never heard a presentation from someone who wasn't a reverse mortgage salesperson. <laughs> how would you like to have discussions about partnering with us? So that's really how it all came about. And we were very grateful for that opportunity to do that. Uh, it's, as I said, it's right down the alley where we wanted to go yeah. as far as educating. So it worked out very well. Anna, was that you? No, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> but good on them for having the initiative. Yes, know? yes, <laughs> yes. Well, Sounds like me. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you have a session uh, here, I think, tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes. And uh, so we're just, again, uh, to recap, we're out here at FPA National. And uh, uh, one of our partners here, Carson, I think, is part of it, right? Jack Campbell yes. is part of it. Um, so what's the goal of the session? What are you talking about? Because it's a little bit different than, again, like... It's, it is... Yeah. It is a little bit different. Jack Campbell, as you mentioned, uh, she is a financial advisor. She's on the panel, but her her, her Mom, mother, rather, yep. is a CPA, and her mother has also used a reverse mortgage. So we're really having a conversation with her mother and Jack as to how this all came about and, and what do they feel about it? What's been the benefit for them? So yeah. it's just kind of an open discussion about that. Yeah, and uh, so that'll be really, yeah. I mean, I've talked to Jack about it a little yes. bit before, but uh, that'll be a really fun conversation. Yeah, um, We actually, um, I think that's a, how often 
do these family conversations really take place? Because that was actually one of the fun parts. I know Jack will talk about tomorrow, but everyone won't be there. Right. But right. Jack was kind of surprised too. I, I yes. remember when she found out. But how do you see these family conversations taking place? I haven't seen a lot of them, and that's why I'm actually kind of intrigued to talk with them tomorrow <laughs> as well. How this all came about, because I have not seen a lot of them. Uh, most of the most of the uh, clients that I've worked with, they don't really care if their children are involved or not. So I haven't seen that conversation, that dynamic. I'll be interested to see how it all plays out. Have you seen a lot of like angry kids though when they parents pass away? At, you well, know, and you know, never knew about it or didn't have that conversation. That's that's an interesting point too because I think that that uh, the. The concern about the children goes back to more of a, I'm going to say more of a needs-based borrower. Uh, and the children are looking at the home as, as their inheritance and everything else. More of the advisors that I work with, the clients that we work with, um, the home is not the only asset that they're passing mm-hmm. on. And they're viewing home equity as a way to safeguard and enhance that legacy, not to deplete it. So yeah. we don't, you know, with the advisor clientele, we don't have problems with the children we just don't yeah yeah it's a, it's interesting like the advisor um, clientele is probably very different than the general market absolutely clientele. it is right absolutely. absolutely I don't have too much on that front no I loved what Steve had to say though all right Craig how was that like I was gonna say I thought you have a broader view on that that like you had because we've talked about this before that there's been kind of a the use of reverse for when you don't have the advisors in place sometimes isn't always optimal, right? That last right. resort notion right. right. kind of led to some negative outcomes where exactly. I've sure. made that argument that I think it, this is one of those areas that advisors absolutely should be involved because right. they actually can help provide better advice without well, well, and I distributing think, a product. You know, but, I think right. to that, and we, we do have, uh, I will jump in on a disconnect, right? Yeah. You know, I, I had the opportunity to present with Steve right. last year at the National FPA, and it was a really well-attended It was. Group. And I think you do run into some dissonance on how this is marketed to consumers late at night mm. using a fair amount Agreed. Of, of kind of, I would say, cheesy older celebrities. Right. And then <laughs> how advisors are approaching the same product. Like, there's there's definitely a dissonance there. No where the consumer is like, wait, <clears throat> I saw a retired NFL quarterback try to sell me this reverse mortgage at 2 a.m., and now you're telling me to buy it. Like, there's right. the marketing channel isn't necessarily <clears throat> advisor friendly to that mm-hmm. end, and I think you run into some issues. Yeah. Like, I think consumer pushback, you know, that comes from not understanding, but then when you're hit with multiple channels, I think that can get difficult. Yeah, and that's worked a little bit, right? So I think your point is it, that's a consumer marketing tactic, not yeah. an advisor marketing uh, exactly. tactic. Exactly. And so advisors, it doesn't resonate as no. well with. Um, yeah, so it's a very interesting. And that's one, one of the <clears throat> excuse me. That's one of the biggest concerns I have about the the future of this program. And you know, the goal or my goal would be to make it a mainstream retirement planning tool. But as long as we have ads that appeal to um, a needs based marketplace. It's never going to happen. You're never going to have more affluent people say, oh, I That's want that me. because I saw so-and-so marketing this on TV late at night. No, they're going to say, I don't want anything to do right. with that. And you see that. And when, yeah. when we That's did last problem. year's FPA, I had advisors come up to, to that end a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a problem. Well, uh, Steve, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. This is great. I think we covered a lot of topics in here. You gave us a good perspective on the kind of housing world and reverse world where it sits today. Anna, do you want to kind of wrap up because you're handling our regular questions here today? Make <laughs> awesome. sure that we don't forget yes, them with Steve. Absolutely. Well, Steve, we always cap it off with one of our favorite questions, which is what does the term finding your freedom mean to you? Finding your freedom. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big broad. We have great, great answers. <laughs> wow. Finding your freedom. That's, gee, I wish I'd been prepped on that one. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, see, that's my bad. <laughs> we yeah, what does it, what right does it mean to we... you when it, when it comes to your mind? Like, what does freedom mean to you, Steve? Um, gee, just, uh, I guess, just the ability to be able to do what you want when you want to do it, I guess. Yeah. That would be kind of my freedom. Love it. And Beautiful. what's one thing you're really excited about doing over the next year? Traveling more yeah. than I have been in the past. 
Yeah. Not, so, and not for conferences. Not for <laughs> conferences, <laughs> for my own. I have probably about two months worth of trips planned over oh, the next year. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, but don't it. tell Finance of America Reverse yeah. that yet. <laughs> yeah, but you, you've told me recently that you were prioritizing that, right? That exactly. you're going to take more trips now. Absolutely. And you, Absolutely. you did have that conversation, I yes. believe. Yes, so, I did. Yeah, I did. I'm, I'm, I'm only kidding on that one. <laughs> yes, I no, I, I'm transitioning uh, mm -hmm. towards, um, you know, working how I want to work mm -hmm. and definitely want to do more traveling. I've come to the conclusion that my bucket list is this big, but my timeline is probably shrinking down this way. And so <laughs> I want to make sure that I can accomplish my bucket list yeah. while I still have the desire and the energy to do it. No. See, that was a great answer. That is a yeah. great answer. <laughs> One of the best, actually. That is fantastic. Oh, thank you. Well, Anna, Craig, and Steve, thank you so much for joining us thanks and having this conversation having today. Everybody else, thanks for listening and watching this episode of the Framework Podcast. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode.